people have been having interesting and sometimes normative experiences under the banner of mysticism and, and spirituality. Is there a form of happiness that is not contingent upon always having one's favorite food available to be placed on one's tongue, or having one's friends and family within arm's reach, or having good books to read, or having something to look forward to on the weekend? Is, is it possible to be happy before anything happens, before one's desires get gratified, in the very midst of life's vicissitudes, in the very midst of old age, disease, and death? There is an alternative to live in it at the mercy of the next neurotic thought that comes careening into consciousness. There's an alternative to being continuously spellbound by this conversation we're having with ourselves. Our habitual failure to recognize thought as thought, our, our habitual identification with discursive thought is a primary source of human suffering. And when a person breaks this spell, an extraordinary kind of relief is available. Just making a moment-to-moment -moment effort to pay undivided attention to the arising of thought and to the arising of, of sensory experience. He experiences things that most scientists and artists are not familiar with unless they've made the identical introspective efforts. And these experiences have something to say about the plasticity of human experience itself and the possibilities of human happiness. It's possible to lose the sense of being separate from one's experience and of you know, riding around in one's head. Uh, and this, it is reported, has many psychological benefits. I mean, it, it reduces anxiety, it reduces hatred, it reduces fear. And actually, what you're left with it, when you do that more and more are rather good feelings. This is not a matter of new information or more information. It, it, it requires a change in attitude. It, it, it requires a change in, in, in the attentiveness you pay to, the, to your experience in the present. And most of us think that there's, there's the, our experience, and then there's, a, there's an eye somewhere behind our eyes appropriating this experience moment to moment, thinking our thoughts. Um, now, as you know, at the level of the brain, this doesn't make any sense. We are locked in the present moment. The path, the, the, a memory is a thought arising in the present. There are ways of experiencing life as sacred without, without believing anything, and certainly without believing anything on insufficient evidence. Okay, there are ways to, to really live in the present moment. Okay, what, what's the alternative? It, it is always now. It's not quite true as a matter of physics, but as a matter of conscious experience, the reality of your life is always now. And I think this is a liberating truth about the nature of the human mind. In fact, I think there's probably nothing more important to understand about your mind than that, if you want to be happy in this world. But the past is a memory. It's a thought arising in the present. The, the future is merely anticipated. It is another thought arising now. Okay, well, what we truly have is this moment and this. And, and we spend most of our lives forgetting this truth, repudiating it, fleeing it, overlooking it. And, and the, the horror is that we succeed. Being, thinking is useful, but being perpetually lost in thought isn't. When you look closely at the mechanics of your own suffering, you find that when you're suffering, you are lost in thought. Many good things happen when you can actually just drop your stress and the automaticity of thinking for a moment and, and just be aware of the next sensation, the next thought, the next moment of a mood. And, and there's just our experience is a flow in the present moment. And I'm not discounting the utility of thought, and I'm, and I'm not discounting the importance of sorting out the world. And we don't want a culture of people who are not engaged and not trying to improve the world. Uh, but if there's any kernel of truth in the religions we so deplore, 
and they are just a carnival of errors. The truth is that it's possible to sink into the present moment in such a way as to find it sacred and to, and to cease to have a problem. The reality of your life is always now. It is always now. So I've never thought of myself as an atheist. Uh, I really just and I continue to think of myself just as a, a person who's trying to be reasonable with all the data that's, that's available. And, and part of that data is that ethics are incredibly important. I mean, pe people have, um, I mean, it's part of the most important aspect of human life and as we try to be happy together as a society. Finding durable reasons to treat others well, seeing the link between our own happiness and the happiness of others. I mean, that is that is uh, a candidate for the most important thing people are engaged in. Um, clearly, we get our ethical intuitions out of our biology on some level. I mean, we, kids are, are even before they're acculturated, they have a sense of. Um, uh, they certainly have a sense of pleasure and pain and the difference. They have a, a, a desire for social gratification. They have an ability to recognize mental states in others at, at, at very early on. Um, and this continually develops. But at a certain point, what develops is uh, an ability to be to compassionate, an ability to actually uh, be concerned with the suffering of others and, and to prefer their happiness. Um, and this ability can be encouraged to greater or lesser degrees, but it seems to me it's encouraged by, by our understanding it uh, as much as we can and not fantasizing about how uh, an invisible and uh, perfectly um, intelligent but strangely maliciously uh, uncooperative deity is demanding that we behave certain ways and you know, not be homosexuals, for instance. And, um, I mean, we can get an we can have a, a truly open-ended discussion about ethics once we keep the the uh, the goal in view, which is human happiness and the happiness of all conscious creatures. I mean, that, that, that it's it's important to realize that we have ethical obligations toward everything we can possibly make suffer to the to the degree we can possibly make it suffer. So if we build a computer that we have reason to believe is conscious we'll have ethical responsibilities towards that computer, whereas we don't have ethical responsibilities towards cameras now because we have no reason to think that they're conscious. Um, and as far as spiritual experience is concerned, you know, I spent a lot of time meditating and practicing meditation, and, and, and there's, um, there's no reason to believe anything on insufficient evidence in order to, to uh, experiment with various methodologies of changing your consciousness. I mean, there's just no question that, that human experience is plastic to a, a remarkable degree, and we understand this somewhat at the level of the brain in terms of neuroplasticity. Um, and I think there's good reason to, to think of, of positive human emotions as being, in some sense, trainable, like skills. I mean, just as you can learn to play the piano, you can learn to be more compassionate than you otherwise would be. And you can learn to feel joy at others' success rather than envy. I mean, these are actually skills that can be trained. And, Beyond that, it's, it's possible to cease to feel like a separate ego locked in a body of flesh. I mean, that's, that is a representation that's going on at the level of the brain that, that can uh, cease to occur, and many people call that an experience of self-transcendence. Uh, I think it's desirable to have such experiences. Again, we don't have to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin or that Muhammad flew to heaven on a winged horse in order to have experiences.
this period in my life was, was just absolutely formative of, of my view of the nature of human consciousness, what the possibilities are for, for changing our experience of the world, um, why it's, it would be interesting to study consciousness and, and subjectivity at the level of the brain. This all this preceded my interest in, in neuroscience. And, um, so what I did in my 20s, really, I, I still practice meditation and I've, I've done some subsequent uh, period of intensive practice on retreat, but in my 20s I spent about two years of that decade on silent meditation retreats, uh, ranging from as short as a weekend to three months. Uh, and most of this was, was done in a, in a Buddhist context, studying a practice called Vipassana, which I blogged about on, on my blog recently. So my comments there. Um, Vipassana is a very simple practice that is just perfectly designed for export into, into science and, and the rational uh, community generally because there is actually nothing you need to presuppose on insufficient evidence in order to get the practice off the ground. You don't have to, you don't even have to like anything about Buddhism. It's just a practice of training attention on the present moment. And you start with your breath, you start with just the experience of, of the sensation of breathing. And as you, as you learn to focus on that one object of attention, the first thing you realize is how difficult it is. People who have not tried to meditate tend not to realize just what a torrent of white noise there is in their, in their mind at every moment. Uh, we're just thinking, 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 thinking every moment of the day. We're chased out of bed by our thoughts in the morning. Uh, we just think, 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 think until we, until we fall asleep at night. And the, the character of this conversation we're having with ourselves is really what engineers our suffering or the, kind of the mediocrity of our, of our uh, lives in every present moment. All of our worry and anxiety and self-doubt and self-criticism. And obviously thoughts are necessary and we couldn't navigate our lives without thinking, but this automaticity of being, lo of being lost in thought without knowing that you're thinking is really the, the string upon which all of our suffering is strung. And meditation is a, is a tool for sort of stepping back from that process and, and discovering the space in consciousness prior to that stream of thinking. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of relief that comes from that. And it's, it's a, it's a so at the first pass, it's a great tool of stress reduction. You, you, you begin to notice why you suffer, how you're suffering, the, the mechanics of suffering moment to moment, um, the mechanics of worry and doubt and, and fear and, and anger, etc. And meditation gives you a tool to sort of relax that automaticity. And um, that tool can be very hard won to get in hand. It's not, it's not easy. Again, the first thing you discover when you go sit in silence for days or weeks and try to meditate every moment of the day is just how hard that task is. Paying attention to the breath is incredibly difficult. Uh, it's, simple to, to, it's a simple instruction, but it's incredibly difficult to do. But at a certain point, you can actually develop enough concentration to do it, and there's an incredible freedom that comes with that. It's just, it's, it is a relief to be able to just put down the burden of your uh, rumination, uh, if only for a moment. Uh, the other thing that comes from it, and the reason why this is, is uh, of such intellectual interest to, to me as part from personal interest, um, is, to, is that it, it breaks the, this cognitive illusion that most of us live with uh, most of the time that we are egos, that we are selves, that we are this something to which this pronoun I can refer riding around inside our bodies. And this is, this is the, the point of view that most, most of you, I think, will find familiar, that you, you don't feel truly identical to your body. You don't feel that you are, you are coterminous with your body, down to your fingertips. You feel that you have a body. You feel that you are a subject living inside the body, which is paradoxically a kind of object. It's a kind of vehicle. Most people feel located behind their eyes, looking out at a world that is, that is other than what they are. And the body is, in some sense, other than what they are. Uh, 
And this is an illusion. This is an illusion that we know this is an illusion neurologically. We know this doesn't make sense scientifically when you just, just reductively look at what the self could possibly be as a, as, uh, a collection of, of systems. Uh, but it doesn't make sense subject. It's a, it's a subjective illusion that can be penetrated. It, it, it is what it feels like to be thinking every moment of the day without knowing that you're thinking. And, and when you can see thoughts as just objects of kind arising in consciousness, consciousness that's prior to them, uh, this sense of, of self, the sense of being this locus of consciousness behind the eyes, looking out at a world that's not self, that you, you, can, you can break that illusion if only for a moment. And breaking that is, um, I think, of great uh, utility, personally, psychologically. It's also of great interest, uh, psychologically, in terms of just how we understand the mind at the level of the brain and, and how we think of ourselves as, as subjective creatures. Um, and it is also the point of contact between any complete description of, of the mind and everything that's really at the core of religious and mystical and spiritual uh, literature. The fascination that the human beings have had for 2,000 years, at least, with notions of, of self-transcendence and, and transforming human life in, 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 a, in the context of religion has been um, seeded by this possibility. I mean, people have lost their feeling of self to, to a great degree, and with that loss has come incredibly positive experiences um, and a, free, a real freedom that is rare in this world. And then they have kind of witnessed that freedom to others and described it in terms of Iron Age pseudoscience and philosophy. So it's, it's, um, you have it all conflated with, with very ancient concepts of being in relationship to a deity, and this is a problem. We're the only language we have had in which to talk about the higher possibility of, of self-transcendence has been religious language, and that's something that I'm, I'm hoping to change in, in, in uh, my next book and in subsequent conversations about this. Uh, I think there are more questions on the subject, so that won't, won't be the last you've heard from me on this subject. The burden is to make sense. The burden is to, is to support people who make sense, uh, read good books, write good books, have uh, consequential conversations, uh, ask hard questions of people who clearly don't know what they're talking about and expose their ignorance and hypocrisy and uh, doublethink to the world wherever you can. The distinction to make is between making claims about the character of your experience and making claims about physical reality or the, or the universe at large. So what I was saying is that you can make claims about your experience and what various methodologies have, have done to change it, and these are of a piece with any other claim about experience that people make, and we can, we can study these changes in experience, so we can study when someone comes into the lab and says they're depressed, or they're hearing voices, or they've got a terrible pain in their knee. These are claims about experience, and we can, we can talk about uh, how those experiences are arising and what to do about them. And spiritual experience is no different. You, do, you can talk about the experience itself and talk about how it's arising in the body at the level of neurophysiology, or what people are doing to, to 
engineer the experience. The difference is when you start talking about what the experience means for the universe, the way, why you're having the experience in some ultimate sense. So the person who feels uh, an experience of bliss while praying can talk about the experience of bliss. That's, there's nothing irrational about doing that. To say that they're experiencing the bliss because it's the grace of God or the grace of Jesus, that is a claim about being in relationship to invisible others which may or may not exist. It's a claim about uh, the, the attention of those very likely non-existent others on your person. Uh, these, are, these are claims that are unjustified and, and in principle unscientific. The claim that you were abducted by aliens is also a claim about the existence of aliens, they're, they're uh, coming to Earth for strange um, proctological uh, experiments done on cattle and people. Uh, I mean, this is, this is not, there, there are reasons to be skeptical of those claims, but if someone's had an experience where they woke up and they saw aliens in their room, it's very likely that it's a hallucination or a dream or some, something we want to talk about in that, in that context. But they can still speak honestly about the character of the experience. It's, it's the what it means in, re, in the external world that is the leap that is, is often unjustified. So in, in speaking about spirituality and mysticism and the experience of, quote, real mystics, I'm talking about the, the very positive changes that have occurred in people's lives based on making really sustained efforts in, in contemplation or, or meditation and uh, it's it's as easy to talk about those things rationally as it is to talk about uh, any other change in experience that is that is uh, internal you know, that is uh, ch any change in the way you feel any change in your understanding of yourself any change it's inconvenient that many of these, these changes can't be demonstrated outwardly and precisely the way that, that uh, we can demonstrate changes in athletic performance, say. But many of them can be demonstrated. Many of them, you know, people can be emotionally quite different than they used to be. Uh, there are neurophysiological correlates of, of expertise in meditation that, that people have studied with neuroimaging. So it's, it, this is, all of this is tractable uh, scientifically. It's just... Can't religion just be a private matter? Why shouldn't we concentrate on eliminating religion, eliminating religion more or less? only in the public sphere, but not worry about what people believe in the privacy of their minds. Uh, can it be something that just provides comfort to people and uh, needs to just simply be kept out of politics? Now, this is, insofar as that's possible, that's true. The problem is it's just generally not possible. Insofar as people really believe what they say they believe, insofar as they really believe that prayer works, for instance, then this belief has to show up in their lives, has to show up in the kinds of decisions they make. They, they, they are motivated by these beliefs, their choices are constrained by these beliefs. Uh, you've got parents who don't take their children to see uh, doctors when they really need to see doctors because they think prayer works. You know, this, is, this is synonymous with, with putting your child's life in jeopardy. Uh, and it happens all the time in those communities where there's beliefs about the efficacy of prayer and, uh, and especially in, in, in uh, faiths like you know, Christian science where, where medical inter interventions are, are anathema. Uh, insofar as, as someone really believes something of, of uh, a religious doctrine or any other doctrine, and there's some circumstance in the world that makes those beliefs relevant, well then you, you can never expect them to, to stay well behaved in the privacy of a person's mind. So 
if the, if the bus driver who's driving your kids to school really thinks prayer works, really works, not just, he's not just paying lip service to it, he thinks that prayer changes the world, that's troublesome. It's troublesome because of all those situations that you can't necessarily foresee where he might decide to rely on prayer as opposed to something else to keep your children safe. So just imagine a bus driver who thinks prayer works and he's exhausted, doesn't really feel up to driving, he probably shouldn't be behind the wheel, but he said a prayer and so nothing bad's gonna happen. That's not the bus driver you want driving your kids to school. It, the, the, the sense that that kind of thing never happens is uh, erroneous. The sense that that kind of thing is unlikely to happen is just merely a sense we have that people don't really believe what they say they believe. And I, and I uh, there are many reasons uh, to take people at their word, especially when certain people do things like fly planes into buildings based on uh, their uh, expectation of paradise. There are clearly people who are not just bluffing. There are clearly people who really believe what they say they believe, and we have to, uh, therefore, put pressure on these beliefs. Uh, and they're not merely a matter of, of a person's private uh, worldview. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a real point of confusion for many people. People think that, people don't notice that there are two senses of the word objective, of the words objective and subjective. There's this sense of what's called ontology, this is what there is to know in the universe, which is what facts are there to talk about. And there are, there are objective facts and subjective facts. There are, there are the facts of the material world spoken of in terms of physics and chemistry, etc. And there, there are facts of the subjectivity of any conscious system within that world. And what it's like to be you in this moment is a, is a, a set of subjective facts which has objective underpinnings. It's a, it has a lot to do with your, the, uh, your body and your brain and your world, etc. But we can talk about human subjectivity objectively, objectively in the epistemological sense, in the sense that we're not being self-deceived, that we're not lying, that we're, we're constrained by, by rational claims, uh, evidence-based claims. So, for instance, a, an example I use, uh, I use in the book The Moral Landscape, and I often use in, in, in this context, I have something called tinnitus, which is often called tinnitus, which is a, a ringing in the ear, which you may have experienced if you've gone to a loud rock concert and, and you, you come home and your, your ears are ringing. For, in that case, it's transient, it goes away, but people can get it based on some, often some damage to the, to the cochlea in the, in the inner ear, and you get ringing in your ear that's basically around for the rest of your life. Now, I have this, I am not lying about it, it's, this is a phenomenon that is known to science. People report this. Uh, they, um, they, uh, a lot is known about the kind of inner ear damage that can produce it. Uh, it's, um, it can be associated with hearing loss in the appropriate frequency. I mean, we, can, we can study tinnitus. We can talk about tinnitus. I can tell you that uh, my experience of it, it seems to be on the right side and is uh, high frequency as opposed to low frequency, so I could match it to a tone that you produced in the world. This is all something that, that this is a feature of my inner life that I can represent in the spirit of scientific objectivity and about which science can know something. Uh, there is no impediment to studying tinnitus, and likewise there's no impediment to studying any other feature of our subjective life. Any moods or emotions or experiences that, that people find uh, compelling to study can be studied. Uh, now it's inconvenient that we must rely on self-report to some degree to study these things. Now it's not that we simply have to take people's word for everything in their inner lives. We know that, that people are actually not always the best judge of the their mo the moment to moment character of their experience and there are ways to get around self report in certain experiments but 
yes, the, the, the cash value of, of uh, changes in experience is always change in experience, and, and there, there, there's often no surrogate for simply having people tell you how their experience has changed. Uh, that's not, uh, it's, it's something worth worrying about in terms of designing any specific experiment, but it's not a, a fundamental epistemological problem that rules out understanding human well-being or good and evil in scientific terms. It's just, it's just not. And if it rules those things out, it rules everything out about the, it rules the entire, entire science of the mind out. There's just no, nothing to be known about depression or schizophrenia or anything else that people have been studying for, for uh, decades in neuroscience and psychology uh, because these things are subjective experiences.